Patrick, welcome to Edinburgh. Thank you for coming all the way from Cardiff. Pleasure. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here at the Asian Scotland Institute and um, ready to sort of set the scene. It's good to be able to talk for a little while before your bigger talk later on today. And uh, welcome, as I say, to the Asian Scotland Institute, where our mission is to educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders in Scotland, um, particularly with regards to international developments and Asia specifically, uh, since that is a world in which we live and where things affect us. But you're good enough to come today to really help us focus on Brexit, on what is going to happen to the UK and its dealings with other international markets um, following the invoking of Article 50 and what will happen. And, of course, you were the founder of uh, Economists for Brexit, um, and this is something to which you've been paying a lot of attention. And I'd be very grateful if you could perhaps give us an idea, first of all, of some of the things that um, we, you're going to focus on as part of what you call the Brexit calculus later on today. Yes, well, it's very nice to be here, Roddy, and to see you again yeah. all these years. Yes. And uh, um, let me say that the centre of the Brexit debate is the is economics of what the EU does. And um, when we joined the EU, it wasn't what it is today, right. and it has developed enormously in terms of scope and kind of philosophy. Yeah. And it is now quite protectionist mm. as countries around the world go. It's yeah. about three times as protectionist as the US, for example. Yeah. In food and manufacturers, which is important to the British consumer. Yeah. And that's a core aim of free trade, to get away from that protection. So bring down the costs of consumer, mm -hmm get world prices yeah. for food and manufacturers and bring competition to bear on those parts of the manufacturing and farming sector that are still not up to speed with world competition, mm -hmm. which obviously brings a gain to the UK economy in lower consumer prices, probably the order of about 8%, yeah. quite a big amount, mm -hmm. and also brings with it a rise in consumer welfare and higher productivity, mm -hmm. which brings us in about another about four percent gain to the economy and yep. GDP. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a big, a big item uh, economically in, 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 in Brexit, and that's why the May government has gone for free trade because yep. that's how you get those benefits. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then the second is, of course, bringing back our own laws and regulation, where the EU has gone hugely into a highly interventionist direction of top-down regulation in areas like energy, um, labor market, finance, even product regulation, mm. where pragmatic British regulation will bring us gains, we think, uh, quite substantial gains, mm. just depending really on how, how, much, how much interventionism the EU goes for over, over the succeeding decades. And this interventionism coming from the EU, is that it's a characteristic of them? That doesn't surprise you? Were they, were they bound to do things like that, in your view? I think the EU is, has a, difficult, a different political mindset to yeah. the UK. I think it's, it's more to the left. Yes. It's more top-down. Mm -hmm. Continental law is much more prescriptive. There's yes. a whole bunch of reasons, really, why that th th this is done differently in the EU from the way we would do it and I think it makes more sense for us to do it our yeah. way because it's yeah. economically I think more laissez-faire. Yeah. Of course the last area is immigration where getting control of our borders is really important to the British voters yeah. and uh, economically important too because if you let unskilled workers in completely freely without any control they bring independence yeah. and they have entitlement to all sorts of benefits yeah very expensive to the British taxpayer and mostly paid for by poor communities that yeah. can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a big item which we've costed at about three and a half thousand per adult unskilled immigrant. And yeah. It's quite a significant sum. So those three things really are the gains from Brexit. And I think that Mrs May's government has, mm -hmm. has now got its head around all that yes. and it's going for free trade, it's going for getting our own laws back, mm -hmm. no European Court of Justice um, jurisdiction and also control of our immigration. Yeah. And I think all that makes a lot of sense economically. In, a, in our conversation earlier today, you, I was amused by your comment that when you talk to business people about this, they generally get it. 
They understand the arguments of free trade, whereas, broadly speaking, politicians and civil servants don't seem to be able to do so with the same facility. True? It and, seems and, and to why be. Why is that, I wonder? Yes, it seems to be. And I think it's because civil servants um, are very much indoctrinated in the EU. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. what they've been all their yes, lives. Sure. So they think of everything through the EU uh, spectacles. Yep. Everything that they do is EU originating. And that's now their comfort zone. Yeah. Politicians are much the same. And also, I think that for, for, for civil servants and politicians, they don't really understand that trade comes from comparative advantage, and businessmen know that. Yes, yes. They know they're out there in the markets the whole time, and so they understand that. They don't necessarily like it. No. And so you'll find a lot of businessmen are against Brexit because, of course, their own interests will be, uh, will be um, badly affected. I mean, they'll have to face more competition. Yes. To which the answer has to be, well, sorry, you mm. had a good run, mm. but now right. it's, the, it's, the, it's the moment of truth. You, you will have to, you'll have to face up to world competition over the next decade or so. Mm. And I think that they understand that. Well, hopefully, as the, sort of, the nation of shopkeepers, as Napoleon mm. referred to us, we'll be able to adapt to that. Although, again, amusingly, in an early conversation, we, we talked about the word entrepreneur, which doesn't have the same meaning in the French language at all. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it, it means much more somebody who administers things, yes. whereas we mean by it someone who's out there looking at opportunities yeah. uh, of trade. And of course, when Napoleon called us a nation of shopkeepers, it was the greatest compliment he ever played us, paid us, because of course we do understand trade. Yes, it's in yes. our blood because we're a nation of grocer, yes. grocers, really. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we like our bills to be uh, suitably low. Yeah. Yeah. We like quality. And we understand that that comes through trade. And, mm -hmm. of course, the, the, the background of our history, of course, it also makes us knowledgeable about trade yeah. because yeah. We, we traded with, with, with countries all over the world sure. and always yeah. have done. And we're a mercantile nation, aren't we? Exactly, yeah. exactly. A seafaring mm -hmm. mercantile nation. Mm -hmm. And so, oddly enough, in the referendum, it was very easy to explain to, yeah. to Brits yeah. what it was all about. Mm. But... The Remainers, uh, you know, were kind of adducing this sort of, oh, it'll be terrible because we're outside the comfort blanket of the EU, without ever engaging with the intellectual argument of free trade. Mm -hmm. And in the end, of course, the, the Mrs. May's government, having, you know, she was a Remainer, a reluctant Remainer, but mm -hmm. once the whole battle was over yeah. and they started to get their heads around the idea of free trade, which, yeah, yeah. Uh, which, is, which is good, yeah. but mm. wasn't easy for, for, for them, given this all-embracing EU effect. Yeah. And I think the propaganda from the EU has always been, oh, well, of course we're in favor of free trade. Um, not meaning by that the same thing as what I mean by free trade, which yeah. is free trade with the world. They yeah. meant free trade inside the EU's kind of perimeter wall with the common agricultural policy with the common that. agricultural policy so yeah. that you get free trade but in a very limited sense inside a wall that keeps out free trade from the rest of the world yeah. the propagandists always played that bit of the perimeter wall down yeah. and and but you, you can't get away from the perimeter wall and that's the point talking of walls sort of brings me on to the other great events that are taking place in the world trump in the us china china's position with the us and and with Europe. Those as factors, the US, China, as it affects the whole Brexit topic. Can you comment on that? I think that's very important because there's been a lot of aggression from EU leaders saying, you know, we'll give you a bad deal, you know, you better yeah. beware Britain, you know, yeah. we are going to come after you, which <laughs> is really stupid talk. And the involvement of of, of, of President Trump and uh, trade agreements with the US and possibly also trilateral trade agreements between yep. the US and the EU brings a, brings a nice note of realism into the picture because the truth is if the EU doesn't do a deal with us of a yep. free trade variety they'll find themselves facing American food mm. and American capital equipment and mm. South Korean cars yes. uh, but particularly the American end mm suppliers of almost everything in the world of very good quality and yeah. good prices, mm -hmm. taking away all our purchases from the EU yeah. overnight. Yeah. And that would be pretty disastrous for a lot of industries in the EU. And the US are already Great Britain's biggest trading partner. 
They are already our biggest export market by a factor of nearly three compared with the next, which is Germany. Yes. So it gives you already an idea of how close we are to the U.S. anyway. Yeah. Um, and they would just love to do a deal whereby they can sell us food without any mm. let or hindrance, you know, with all this GM uh, which they would dispute, be able to do. Which they'd be able to do. Yeah. At the moment, they're in dispute in all sorts of ways. They face huge tariffs mm -hmm. to get into the EU market, including ours. And on capital equipment, uh, where they're the world's biggest, most competitive suppliers of capital equipment, uh, they're also kind of subject to huge tariffs from the EU and non-tariff barriers. Yeah. Here we are in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Scotland, which voted by a fairly significant margin to remain in Europe. Um, what's your message to listeners in Scotland who are watching this interview um, about anything, anything in particular affect Scotland or why Scotland should not be concerned about the United Kingdom coming out of Europe? Uh, Scotland, like Wales, like the North West, yeah. is a very typical yes. British region mm -hmm. with, with very typical kind of structure, quite a lot of finance, quite a lot of manufacturing. Yep. Um, and it's also farming. Yes. There are huge gains for the Scottish economy and the Scottish consumer mm. from Brexit, yep. free trade. I mean, after all, free trade, Adam Smith, David Hume, yes. they were all believers in free trade Absolutely. and explained, were the early philosophers and economists that explained it all, mm. Scots, of course. Yep. Um, so it's in Scotland's interest. It's in yep. the Scottish consumer's interest. Yep. And it would be a bitter irony if they followed Nicola Sturgeon into some sort of relationship with the EU whereby they were in the single market, inside the customs union, with all that EU protectionism and regulations yeah, yeah, yeah. and immigration. Mm. And across the border, the English consumer has prices 8% lower, yeah. uh, GDP 4% higher. Yeah. And Scottish consumers are having to cross the border to get lower-priced cars and yep. lower-priced food yep. and are caught by the, the anti-smuggling police <laughs> of Peebles <laughs> yes, yes. and Gretna. Yep. And this yep. would be a very sad moment for Scotland to follow, you know, it this would. Pied Piper yep. of the Holyrood Parliament mm. into a complete economic wilderness, really. Mm. Well, maybe she or they also will begin to understand the reality of what's going on. And in terms of Asia, uh, and dealing with China and dealing with the other major markets of South Asia, like India. And how, would you, how do you see that playing out? Well, free trade means free trade. Yeah. I think the difficulty um, is that free trade agreements may be held up by all sorts of demands from India and China yeah. yes, yes. For, for unrealistic uh, things, uh, which... Um, what we really want is for us to be able to buy the best stuff out of India and China yes. at world prices. Yes. Yes. And then really we don't care very much whether we have access to their markets, frankly, because we already sell quite a lot to China and India. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize is that if somebody gives you more access to their markets, you haven't got any more to produce. Yeah. You've just got to take it from some other market. Yep. And you don't get a higher price either at the end of the day yep. when world market competition's worked its way out. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's not a lot of gain, actually, from elaborate free trade agreements. The, the main gain we get from free trade agreements is we, we abandon the barriers to our own markets. Yeah, absolutely. Because our own barriers are self-harm. And, and, and that's the main gain from free trade agreements. And if we, in the process of, of free trade agreements, you know, we, we have better access to Indian and Chinese markets, there's, there's no harm in that, mm. but it's not actually going to gain us very much. So the main thing is to be buying from them, Absolutely. so yeah. our consumers get the best opportunities in the world. Yeah. Remember you're also saying that if you have to explain an argument too much, you're also losing it. Do you think there's been too much analysis of this by people uh, who are skeptical? Um, well, you know, the thing is that these arguments are cumulative. It's a bit like teaching first-year economics, yeah. uh, you know, you, you keep on keep on repeating the points until yeah. they yeah. kind of get through, and uh, it is hard stuff yeah. for people to understand, because economics is about indirect effects. Yeah. Everyone can see the first round effect of everything. Yeah. You know, they see, you know, some 
there's free trade, say, you know, and some industry kind of has to contract a bit. They say, oh gosh, mm. losing jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgetting, because yeah. the second round, new industries arise that hire the workers that are contracting out of the other, yep. that are being lost by the other industry. There's still full employment yes. and there's more productivity. Yes. That's economics. That's hard for people to understand because they only see the first round. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that's, that's life, isn't it? Yep. So you have to kind of explain to them how it's a series of rounds and things are going to happen indirectly that are brought on by the initial impact and those are good. That's, no, what, David, that's, what, that's what David Hume yes. and Adam Smith did, yes, yes. you know, and, and for them it was a huge revelation to people. Gosh, that's what's happening. You mean, you mean we can actually produce a pin? Mm. Yes, yes, <laughs> you know? yes. Absolutely. Remember the famous I pin do. example by I Adam do. Smith? I do. Huge revelation to yeah. people because it's sort of, it's not obvious at first sight. No. So it is a difficult subject, and so it's kind of like, yes, when you're explaining you're losing, no question, but oddly enough, the British people always understand these things very quickly. Yes, yes. Uh, and I've never had any trouble explaining stuff to, to, to British, British voters, because mm. they, they just have an intuitive grasp yeah. of markets yeah. and trade, and uh, as you were saying earlier, the civil servants are the ones who get in the way, mm. and the politicians, ah. who are so, of course, worried about their constituency, you know, the, the, the firm in their constituency yeah. that wants favours. Votes. And well, votes, and probably maybe pays for this and that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. Later on today, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of interest to what you're going to be talking about. There'll be lots of questions for you, and I hope you'll enjoy answering them. Uh, and there are a number of people who have been looking forward to your coming up here and hearing what you have to say about Brexit, Brexit obviously in the context of Europe but also in the context of this being the century of Asia and how that will affect us in the UK and Scotland. And Patrick, thank you again for, we got up early this morning and made it all the way up here on the direct flight from, from Cardiff and we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say later today. Thanks, it's a, it's a pleasure, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. Thank you, thanks very much, thank you.